This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. When you think about the reality of Noah's Ark, you might have questions about its size, its construction, or its cargo. Because you've probably seen the pictures like I have of a quaint little boat and an old pudgy man and a handful of animals packed inside. We show these pictures to our children in books and in video. But what was Noah's Ark really like? Did Noah and his sons really build the Ark? And did they really live on it with all those animals for months? And how about the big question? How large was the Ark? I mean, how long, how tall, how wide? Well, on these questions, we don't have to be left wondering. In the Bible, God gives precise measurements to Noah for exactly how big the ark should be. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. And there you are. In God's instructions are the very precise measurements for the ark. But you might be wondering, but what's a cubit? We don't use the cubit as a modern unit of measurement. But in the ancient world, the cubit simply referred to the length of a man's forearm from the elbow to the fingertip, roughly 18 inches. And being such a practical form of measurement, it was likely the most common unit of length in the ancient civilizations, such as the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Egyptian, and the Hebrew. Now with the understanding that one cubit is 18 inches, or a foot and a half, how big was the ark? In order to help us visualize what these dimensions mean, I am standing here next to the only full-scale, floating, modern-day replica of Noah's Ark, built based on the Bible specifications. The Ark is 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet tall. Inside there are three decks. Each deck has over 30,000 square feet, which means that the Ark has a total of over 100,000 square feet. Its volume is equivalent to 1.5 million cubic feet, or approximately 17 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Now, while some of the specific construction details of this modern replica may be different from the actual ark that Noah built, what this modern-day representation does provide is an astounding perspective of the actual dimensions and scale of Noah's ark. Let's take this monumental structure and explore its size. Let's first try to put the ark's length, 450 feet, in perspective. A convenient comparison is to think about some popular modern sporting venues. Take, for example, an American football field. The length of the ark is equivalent to the length of one and a quarter of these fields, measuring from goalpost to goalpost. Or, if you're a baseball fan, sitting in Yankee Stadium in New York, on the front row behind home plate. The 450-foot arc very nearly matches the distance from your seat to the farthest wall out in center field. Or maybe cricket is your game, and you're watching a test match from the grandstand at the historic Lord's Cricket Grounds in St. John's Wood, London. The arc would fill the length across the widest portion of the field. Let's consider the arc's length compared to some famous historical structures across the world. Imagine the ark being stood on its end in a vertical fashion, and let's compare it first to the famous Leaning Tower of Pisa in Italy. Completed in the 14th century AD, it stands 183 feet tall and has a diameter of 49 feet. If we now move to the country of China and the Lao Di Pagoda, completed in the 11th century AD, this pagoda stands 276 feet tall. Made of brick and stone, it is the tallest existing pre-modern pagoda in China. The two towers in Bologna, Italy, were completed in the early 12th century AD. These towers served as the inspiration for the architect Manuro Yamasaki, who designed the former World Trade Center towers in New York. The tallest of the two towers, the Asinelli Tower, stands 318 feet tall. Moving now to England, we find the Elizabeth Tower and its clock known as Big Ben, arguably one of the most recognizable clock towers in the world. 
It was completed in 1859 and stands 316 feet tall and has a 50-foot square base. Across the Atlantic in the United States, the famous Statue of Liberty, dedicated in 1886, stands 305 feet tall from the ground to Lady Liberty's torch. The Cathedral of Antwerp in Belgium has a spire completed in the 16th century extending 404 feet high. In Washington, D.C., the Washington Monument is the tallest true obelisk in the world. Its pyramid-shaped capstone was placed in 1884 at a height of 555 feet. It has a square base of 55 feet on its sides. Only five years after the Washington Monument was completed, the Eiffel Tower in Paris was finished, standing an amazing 986 feet tall and was the tallest structure in the world for over 40 years. Now the last two structures to show for comparison are ancient structures built thousands of years ago and were listed among the seven wonders of the ancient world by Antipater of Sidon and Herodotus. The Lighthouse of Alexandria is known from both ancient writings and from underwater archaeological excavations. Approximately 400 feet tall, it was constructed in the 3rd century BC by Ptolemy I. It stood for 1700 years until its structure was ruined by earthquakes. A replica now stands in Shangsha, China. The Great Pyramid of Giza stands 455 feet tall. It represents one of the most ancient existing structures in all the world. It was the tallest known structure in the world for over 3,000 years. These comparisons can provide a relative sense of the length of the ark, which is quite long but not unreasonable or surpassing our comprehension. Now let's consider the area marked out by the ark and the amount of deck space that the ark would provide. According to Genesis 6.16, the ark was divided into three decks, lower, second, and third. So if Noah were to make a visual inspection around all three decks, he would have to walk about six-tenths of a mile. If we now take our length and our width for each deck, we can calculate the square footage to be 33,750 square feet per deck, which means that the entire ark had a total of 101,250 square feet. Going back to our common sports comparisons, the ark would have had the same approximate area as two American football fields, or 21 basketball courts. So we've discussed the length of the ark and the area included in the decks. But before we calculate its total internal volume, let's consider the end dimensions. 75 feet wide by 45 feet tall. These cross-sectional dimensions very nearly match the wingspan and the tail height of NASA's space shuttle. So if you were to open the end of the ark and begin loading in the shuttles, you would be able to load in the shuttle Atlantis, then the space shuttle Discovery, then the shuttle Enterprise, and then the shuttle Endeavour would nearly fit up until its engines. So almost four NASA space shuttles would fit within the volume of the ark. Now in terms of transporting cargo, the ark's immense volume would be equivalent to carrying 527 railroad boxcars. Or when calculated, it comes out to be over 1.5 million cubic feet of internal space. Oftentimes there are wild misconceptions about Noah's Ark. One of the first says that Noah's Ark is the largest floating vessel to have ever been built. This is simply not true. Though it was the largest vessel at its time in history, there have been many ships built in the millennia afterward that have been comparable and even greater in size. Now this should not discredit or lessen the Ark's extremely significant place in history, but instead it should bring into our view an accurate reality for the biblical proportions of Noah's Ark. Let's look at a few well-known historical ships to compare with Noah's Ark. Let's start with the Santa Maria, part of the trio of ships sailed by Christopher Columbus in the late 15th century AD to cross the Atlantic Ocean to the Americas. It was approximately 60 feet long and carried a crew of approximately 40 men. 
At 227 feet, the HMS Victory is one of England's most well-known wooden warships. It is the oldest naval ship still commissioned, having seen action in the Napoleonic Wars. It is now dry docked in Portsmouth, England as a museum ship. The early 20th century in the United States saw some of the last wooden sailing vessels built. At 330 feet long, the Wyoming was one of only a few six-masted schooners to be built. The Wyoming sailed the eastern coast of the United States from 1909 to 1924. King Sneferus' boats, referenced on the ancient Palermo stone. If we now look back in the annals of history, we find ancient Egyptian inscriptions on this stone of a 100 cubit, that's a 150 foot wooden ship that was part of the fourth dynasty fleet of King Sneferu, a matter of only hundreds of years after the flood. Later during Egypt's 18th dynasty, a barge, possibly in excess of 200 feet, known as Hatshepsut's barge, was constructed to transport large obelisks along the Nile. In the early years of the Roman Empire, Emperor Caligula had numerous large ships. One called the Giant Ship is recorded to be 340 feet long, possibly served as a barge to transport large structures from Egypt back to Rome. In the early 15th century AD, the Ming Dynasty established itself as a naval power. They constructed a large fleet of wooden ships, the largest in the range from 300 to 400 feet long. The ships were known as treasure ships and were used on numerous voyages to enhance the Ming's tributary system. The Zahir I is a modern vessel designed as a livestock carrier. At 393 feet long and 69 feet wide, its deck space is only slightly less than Noah's Ark. And it is currently sailing the oceans, carrying thousands of animals between the international markets of Australia, South America, Middle East, and other. In particular, skeptics of the Ark have pointed specifically to the Wyoming schooner as representing the upper limit to the size of a wooden vessel. However, this criticism fails on two levels. First, there are documented historical wooden vessels at and surpassing the 300-foot limit. Secondly, the Wyoming schooner sailed and performed its duties for over 14 years, while the Ark only needed to operate for one year's time. Now, in the last 150 years, advancements in the construction of metal ships and ocean liners has seen the production of enormous vessels, like the Great Eastern, the Titanic, the Queen Mary, and any number of modern-day cruise ships. These ships have become essentially floating cities, with thousands of travelers, crew, and a multitude of onboard destinations. However, in terms of wooden ships, the Ark does rank among the largest in history. This has led some to claim that even though the Ark's size is not unreasonable, it was still too advanced a vessel for Noah to build. Because he would have needed understanding of physics, calculus, structural analysis, and naval engineering to have designed and built such a vessel. This perspective, however, suffers from several misconceptions. First, it assumes that Noah himself was the originator for the ark's scale and design. But according to the Bible, this is not the case. It was God who initiated and conveyed the ark's plans. Noah was given divine direction and instruction and then expected to contribute his labor in carrying out the task. Second, there is often an overarching misunderstanding that says, well, hasn't man had a long evolutionary history with a gradual growth of both intellectual and physical capacities? This concept of a gradual evolutionary ascent for man is contrary to the biblical concept of man's origin, and it unnecessarily confuses the actual time frame for the early accounts of Genesis. The accounts of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Enoch, Methuselah, and Noah were not tens of thousands of years ago, let alone millions. Noah did not live at a time of club-carrying, cave-dwelling Stone Age men who lacked the abilities of fire, agriculture, or linguistics. According to the Bible's account of creation, mankind was created and endowed with reasonable faculties, including communication, socialization, critical thinking, and ingenuity. So in what time period did Noah live? Well, let's consider a basic historical timeline to give us a context. 
Based on both biblical and secular history, the time from today back to the life of Jesus is approximately 2,000 years. From the time of Jesus in the first century AD back to the patriarch Abraham is again about 2,000 years, based on the genealogies of New Testament and the corroboration of secular history. Now from Abraham back to Noah and the ark can be approximated to be on the order of hundreds of years. And from Noah back to the first created couple, Adam and Eve, was a little over 1,600 years. Thus, we can see that the timeline of the flood and Noah's life was between four to 5,000 years ago. In secular history terms, the general description for this time period, four to 5,000 years, is the Bronze Age, which gains this name from the copper and bronze tools that were being used. Biblical history concurs with this general naming convention because it specifically speaks of a descendant of Cain named Tubal-Cain, who was a relative contemporary of Noah, and who the Bible says was an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. Recognizing that Noah lived during the aptly named Bronze Age provides a good historical setting and helps us recognize what types of materials and resources Noah had access to use. First and foremost, God's instructions for the design of the ark clearly define the primary building material, wood, and Noah needed lots of it. Noah would have had to gather wood for a large variety of structural purposes. Large, load-bearing beams for the primary framing of the ark's structure. Lumber that would form the exterior of the ark. Lumber for the rooms or nests various pins, corrals, cages, decking lumber for internal flooring of the lower, second, and third decks. Since there would be only one door to enter, internal ramps or stairs would provide a means to move between decks. Now a subtle yet important aspect is that for all of the construction and obvious woodworking, Noah would have needed a good number and variety of tools. So what types of tools would have existed in his day? We've already established that even in terms of secular and biblical history, Noah lived in the so-called Bronze Age, meaning the use of copper smelting and alloys. But let's also consider some additional biblical references to various vocations that were in existence even prior to Noah. Farming and agriculture has existed since the very creation of man in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were given the original directive to tend and keep it. And after their sin and subsequent removal from the garden, Adam was to till the ground. Reasonably then, Adam's oldest son, Cain, was also called a tiller of the ground. What this means is that prior to Noah, for over 1,000 years, mankind had worked, tilled, and cultivated crops. Though we don't know specifics, 1,000 years is a long time to develop processes and tools to carry out your trade. We also see within the first family the vocation of cattle raising and shepherding. Adam's second son, Abel, was described as a keeper of sheep. And we find him in Genesis 4 bringing the first fruits of his flocks as a sacrifice to God. We know the skill of tending flocks and raising cattle continued throughout subsequent generations because we read of Cain's descendant, Jabel, being described as the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. Jabel had two other brothers, Jubal and Tubal-Cain, who provided for us a glimpse of some other unique and skilled vocations. The Bible describes Jubal as the father of all those who play the harp and flute. The production of musical instruments, such as stringed instruments and wind instruments, requires precision, both in craftsmanship and tooling. The Bible describes Tubal-Cain as an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. Metalworking and blacksmithing represent very important and applicable trades to the construction efforts in which Noah would be engaging. Considering Noah's historical context and these various occupations that are known to have existed, it's reasonable to consider that Noah had many potential metal tools and implements at his disposal. Likely heavy tools like axes, hammers, mallets, pry bars, and maybe some forms of woodcutting saws. Considering the reference to musical instruments, like harps and flutes, there may have been light-duty tools like punches, chisels, or clamps. Though the primary structure of the ark was wood, 
Various metal fasteners might have been used by carpenters and woodworkers, such as nails and spikes, strappings and bracings. One final comparison to consider that provides great insight into the potential capabilities that existed during the Bronze Age, and for mankind's ingenuity in general, is the Great Pyramid of Giza. As the only surviving member of the original Seven Wonders of the Ancient World, the Great Pyramid stands as an amazing example of mankind's capabilities. Though it was not the very first pyramid built, the Great Pyramid is one of the earlier known and represents a man-made structure completed within a span of only hundreds to a thousand years after the time of the Flood. Having the plans, the materials, and the tools is sufficient to start a task, but some question whether Noah had the time or ability to complete the ark. If we look back for one moment to our discussion of the Great Pyramid of Giza, its massive stone structure actually encompasses a volume over 50 times that of the ark. It's estimated that there are approximately 2.3 million stone blocks, each weighing an average of two and a half tons. The blocks were cut and transported from numerous quarries, some nearby and some many miles away. They were then moved, raised, and precisely installed into place. When we consider the ark, the wood composition would have been far easier to gather, cut, and install than the stone blocks of the pyramid. Although the specific details of Noah's day-to-day -day construction are not recorded for us in the Bible, it does describe the general requirements given to Noah and the final results of the ark saving all that was on board. Thus Noah did, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. For the construction, there are numerous reasonable options that would have aided Noah. First, the time frame. Noah had to complete the task is usually referred to as being in the range of 100 years. We gauge this from Noah being 500 years old when he and his wife began to have their sons in Genesis chapter 5. And then the flood came when he was 600 years old in Genesis chapter 7. And 100 years is a long time to work on any project. Second, could Noah have had help? Since Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives were all ultimately saved on the ark, it's usually understood that they were all involved in the preparation process. But in addition, Noah's father, Lamech, and grandfather, Methuselah, were alive until just prior to the time of the flood, and each of these patriarchs had other sons and daughters. Could Noah's father, grandfather, uncles, or other family have helped? Or could Noah have hired laborers, even skilled laborers, from nearby communities and cities? Potentially. Third, in regards to even gathering the materials, the known vocations of farming, shepherding, and blacksmithing probably depended on other existing trades and services like marketplaces to sell and trade goods, woodworking and carpentry, mining of ores for smelting. Even during Cain's life, we read of him building a city and calling it after his son Enoch. Could Noah have purchased, traded, or bartered for needed lumber and materials? Assuming a 10-hour workday, there are over 3,650 working hours per year, which means that Noah had 365,000 working hours in his 100-year time span. If we then multiply this by four, considering Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, then there were nearly 1.5 million man hours. If we add Noah's wife and the wives of his sons, then there were over 2.5 million working hours to gather materials, construct, and prepare the internal dwellings. This modern-day replica of Noah's Ark was built within 20,000 man-hours. Of course, there were many modern-day technologies and resources utilized, but Noah had 125 times this amount of time, only accounting for the time his family would contribute. The Bible's account of the structure and size of Noah's Ark places it as a perfectly sufficient vessel for its unique task. Its massive size has established its important purpose throughout history. Yet in the context of various historical structures and boats, the ark's dimensions are not unreasonable to have been completed using the materials God instructed in the time God provided with the resources Noah had available.
World Video Bible School has additional Bible-based resources, including hundreds of video programs on various topics that are available free online or for purchasing on DVD. These programs, along with other print and audio materials, are available at wvbs.org.